Okay, I think it's time to make a start. Um, my name is Simon Clock, I'm the EGU's uh, Committee Programme Coordinator. And today we're talking uh, vanishing glaciers, um, what's causing glacial melt, uh, how it's an impact as humans, uh, and what the future glacial melt might be. Um, and joining us today is uh, Dr. Harry Zaklari, a glaciologist at University Libre du Cassels, with a specific interest uh, in the evolution of mountain glaciers and ice caps and their changing climate conditions. Uh, Harry also engages in outreach programs, such as communicating science at school and through other popular media. So welcome, Harry. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Of course. Um, yeah, so to kick us off, just could you introduce yourself, tell us a little about your, um, your background? So uh, my name is Harry. I'm a glaciologist from Belgium, which is a bit strange because, of course, there's no glaciers in Belgium. Uh, but we have a very keen interest on glaciers in Belgium, like the Netherlands and other countries, because if glaciers melt, sea levels go up. And we are countries that are very close to, to the sea level, uh, the coasts. So that's why there's a, a, a big interest. Um, maybe a few words about myself. I grew up in Italy, close to the, the mountains, in fact. And I always had this profound interest in mountains and, and glaciers. And then eventually I ended up doing research in that direction uh, during my PhD in Brussels. Then I did uh, two postdocs, one in uh, Zurich and one in Delft. So one in Switzerland and one in the Netherlands. And uh, for now I'm, I'm back in, in Belgium in Brussels uh, studying glaciers. That's a bit in a nutshell. Thanks. Yeah, I always find um, the science always stems from some kind of uh, much younger or childhood interest. I am um, I researched uh, eco hydraulics, and my background is I spent a lot of time as a kid in rock pools, so I think they're yeah. very very related. Um, the link. Yeah. yeah. So you say you're a glaciologist, but of course that's a quite broad discipline. Could you perhaps narrow it down a bit for us? What what area are your expertise in? And mm -hmm. How how that perhaps differs from other areas of glaciology. Yeah. So in glaciology, there's people looking at ice, uh, and this can mean very different ways. Uh, we're looking at terrestrial ice, so which is typically ice that at one point in time was snow that compacted and formed into ice. And uh, ice is distributed a bit everywhere on Earth. But to give you a broad idea, there's two big ice sheets. There's one, the Greenland ice sheet in the Northern Hemisphere. There's the Antarctic ice sheet in the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm not really looking at these two big ice sheets, but I'm mostly looking at mountain glaciers. Um, there's about 200,000 of them in the world. And this is one of the things that we are trying to do. We're trying to make some projections about how these glaciers will um, evolve in the future. And so I would say I'm mainly focused on, on glaciers, mountain glaciers, and also on modeling. I mean, there's also people doing a lot of observations with satellites, remote sensing, really trying to, to understand what is happening to the glaciers. And we use these kind of observations and we feed them, uh, in fact, into our models, our models, which are thousands of lines of code that we use. We press buttons and then we look how glaciers evolve. So that's the kind of, of science that we're doing here. So um, bouncing from that, I think it's a good time to kind of try and frame a context of a discussion. Um, glacial ice loss, uh, it's a... I think like a fairly common feature in the media when it comes to the um, impacts of climate change. Um, but how like bad is the current ice loss? I think that's probably like the key question. Like, do you have an idea of how it's changing, and how do you have that idea? Well, so we know that glaciers, because of all of these observations, uh, we really know that glaciers are dramatically changing. Uh, we know this um, by going in the field. And if you just go in the field, it's probably one of the clearest indicators of changing climatic conditions. There's a lot of, of nice ways to go to glaciers where they put a stake and they say the glacier was here, the front of the glacier was here uh, 20 years ago. And sometimes the glacier is two, 300 meters further away. So it's really a very visual thing. You can really see how glaciers change. And of course, we go on glaciers also to measure in detail how much glaciers melt. So we go, we plant, for instance, a stake which we, for instance, drill 10 meters deep into the ice. And the next year we come back. And if there's only two meters in, well, then we know that eight meters have melted out. And these are really detailed observations, but we're now getting really into an era where we're going to be using or we're using more and more all these um, 
remote sensing observation, which means observations by satellites. With satellites, we can identify, in fact, how glaciers change. And we now have studies that for every glacier on Earth, so for every of these 200,000 glaciers on Earth, they can show us how these glaciers have changed over the past 20 years. And there's a few exceptions, but almost everywhere on Earth, we see that glaciers are, are thinning. And of course, at the very front of your glacier, if your glacier thins and there's no ice left, then you get this effect, which looks like if your glacier is retreating, which is just because at one point, if you have five, 10 meters of ice, five meters of ice, well, at one point you have just zero meters of ice. And so the glaciers are thinning and are retreating. And this is something that we can observe in, well, in many kinds of ways. So it's, it's not just that the, um, I suppose, shortening, but also that the, the depth of the ice is also thinning as well. Yes, definitely. So glaciers are really thinning. We especially see that the lowest parts of glaciers, for mountain glaciers, typically the highest part is way higher than the lowest part. Uh, for instance, the glacier on which I worked a lot during my PhD and on which we did a lot of field work is the Moziach Glacier in Switzerland, which is very well accessible. And um, what we see, for instance, uh, for, for this uh, particular glacier, so for, for the, the Moziach Glacier, we see that the glacier is thinning but especially at the lowest parts, which is around 2,000 meters. Just to give you an idea, the highest part, point of the glacier is around 4,000 meters. The lowest one is around 2,000 meters uh, in elevation. And there we have some parts where up to 10 years ago, there was still 50 meters of ice and there's no ice left now. So there's really places where every from year to year, we see that the ice is sitting 5 to 10 meters. Uh, so the main thing, and especially in the lowest parts, they're very susceptible uh, to changing climatic conditions. Climate change. Uh, is like the key, I think, word here for driving glacial loss. Could you talk to us a bit more about what is driving it, like how the glacial mass loss uh, occurs? Yes. yes, so so definitely the changing climatic conditions are really uh, driving this these changes in glaciers. And what we see, in fact, is to put it a bit in a in a simplified way, uh, a glacier. Let's take a healthy glacier. So, a case without climate change. A glacier, in fact, will always become a, big, a bit bigger during winter when there's a lot of snow. And during summer, it will always lose a bit of, of mass. So even a healthy glacier will also lose some mass during summer. So there's a bit this, there's a bit this expansion of the glacier in winter if you take the total volume. And then in, in winter and in summer, you get this reduction. And what we see now with changing climatic conditions, of course, the winter also changes. But the main change that we see is that it still becomes a bit bigger during winter, but during summer, it's just going to lose a lot of, of, of mass just because the temperatures are too high. So the healthy glacier can compensate the mass loss during summer with what it gains in winter. And the unhealthy glacier is just losing so much during summer that what it gains during winter is not enough. So in the end, it's just year by year, it's an imbalance and you're just losing more mass um, than, than you're gaining. Um, Maybe an, another way of seeing it is a glacier typically consists of two parts. There's the highest part where typically you have mass gain at the surface, and there's the lowest part where typically you have mass loss at the surface. And a healthy glacier is just gonna function because of gravity. You have too much mass in the highest part and that is brought down to the lowest part. And another way of, of, of seeing what is happening now is there's still the two parts of the glacier, there's still the upper part where you gain mass, and there's a lower part where you lose mass and there's still this, this mass transfer. So a glacier is something dynamic, it moves, it brings ice from the highest to the lowest parts, but the mass supply from the highest part is simply just not enough. So there's not enough mass being supplied and as a consequence, your lowest parts of the glacier will be thinning, thinning and eventually also retreating. I think one of the key questions that pop up to me when you're discussing, um, I suppose, how much these glaciers are thinning is, their sensitivity. Um, I'm guessing the rate to which they melt doesn't stay the same as the climate warms um, that uh, ice loss will accelerate perhaps. Yes, indeed. So the, the glaciers are dynamic and, and they're, they're, they're moving over time. And what is in fact happening is a glacier responds pretty slowly to changing climatic conditions. So it means that the changes that we will see for the glaciers in the coming 10 to 20, 30 years are in part already driven by the climatic conditions that we've had now. Um, another way of putting it, the glaciers today, they're too big for the present day climate. And so what we see when we make these, these projections for future glacier changes 
is that on the one hand, there is what we call a kind of a committed loss. So even if we would be able to stop the warming at the present day level, which we can't, but if we could um, have the warming at the present day level, even then glaciers would continue to lose mass. But of course, on top of that, we know there's projections that temperatures will keep on increasing. And of course, the question is by how much, and this will depend on policy decisions. And then of course, everything that has been decided um, in during the COP in Glasgow, all, all of these elements will, will, will determine in which direction the climate will evolve. And this will, in the, this will then eventually also really dictate how much uh, glacier loss we will have. But so what is important to keep in mind is the fact that they respond slowly and so that the future evolution is always in part driven um, by further warming, but also by their present day imbalance compared to present day conditions. Maybe just to, to give one number to put that a bit in perspective. Um, what, what we've, made, we've been making some simulations for all glaciers in the European Alps. That's about 4,000 glaciers and about their future evolution. Uh, and in, in these projections, in fact, we see that over the coming 30 years, so between now and 2050, we'll be losing about 50% of the glacier volume. Uh, we'll be losing about 50%. And most of this mass loss is not due to the additional warming that also plays a role, but most of this mass loss is really due to the present day imbalance. So the, just the fact that the glaciers still need to adapt to the, the past conditions. So I suppose a key um, aspect of that is that even if um, we stopped emissions now, um, there will still be some level of warming. Um, or at least if you stop the increase in emissions, there'll be still some sort of level of warming. Um, so the future is that even um, our probably optimistic uh, curves in emission reduction, is there still going to be a huge, huge impact on uh, glacial melt? I think that's what I'm getting from your description of how, they're, how sensitive they are. Yes, correct. So there, there will be a, a big loss anyway, but maybe a thing that is really important to stress is that the future loss will really be dictated by what we're doing today. So if we take this example again of the glaciers in the European Alps, where I told you in the coming 30 years, we'll lose, we'll lose 50% of their volume. Well, we show that in 2100, it really depends on which emission scenario we'll be following. And there, I mean, the situation is pretty grim for glaciers in the European Alps because they're pretty sensitive. Um, they're they're in a region that is that is fastly warming, but in a in a good case, we we think we could still stay, save save one third of the present day mass. So this is in a case where think of Paris Agreement, which means where we'll be able to get the warming that's on a global scale compared to pre-industrial levels around plus one point five to plus two degrees. If we're able to get this, we could still save one third of the volume. I mean, it's still not a lot, but just to give you the bad side, or if we really would, if emissions would really go through the roof or, or stay at present day levels, and we, we do not invest in new energies and we stay away from the Paris Agreement, in that case, there's almost no ice left. So we lose more than 90% of the total uh, volume. That's for the European Alps. But these, these, these numbers, I think you, they're pretty general for other regions too. Of course, typically they will have less loss, but this idea that the, um, the present day actions that we take and the, the the amount of warming that we'll have in the coming decades to century will really have a big influence on how much ice will be left in the different regions around the world. So an optimistic scenario would see uh, two thirds of the current alpine glacial mass disappear. Is that for the Europe, Yes, for the European Alps, yes. But then just to put it in perspective, if we take the, so that's 4,000 glaciers, if we take these 200,000 glaciers around the world, the situation is less grim because the European Alps are relatively low in elevation compared to other mountain ranges. And we see that in, in other places like in high mountain Asia or places where typically glaciers are at much higher elevation, they're typically the mass loss are also the, the Arctic regions where there's also a lot of glaciers except for the ice sheets. Think of Arctic Canada, Alaska and others. Um, their glaciers uh, are projected to be losing a bit less, but nevertheless, there will be, still be important um, mass losses, especially under, under a high warming. Um, but for European Alps, even in a good scenario, we'll be losing about two thirds. At least that's what our model says. And models are also tools and there's also uncertainties related to these models. Um, but that's what our, our numerical simulations do. Um, maybe something 
to explain it more a bit in general, because it seems a bit like a black box, like something we put stuff in and then it projects something. What we always try to do with these, these models, uh, the, these, these long codes is, what we uh, try to do is we know how glaciers changed in the past. So what we typically try to do is also first as a kind of a check to see does our model work, is we're also gonna try to first reproduce what happened in the past. And that gives us some confidence in the fact that our model is able um, to reproduce past changes. By the way, this we can also use to tune some, some parameters in our model. And then once this is done, we make projections and these projections for what they're worth, uh, they're telling us that uh, for the European Alps, we could be losing two thirds of their mass, uh, even in a, in a pretty good case. Sure, so um, these, the models you use then um, are basically using uh, historical data, I suppose, like perhaps paleo data as well, um, to test and train the models, which use then for predicting future ice loss. Is that correct? Yes, correct. It really depends on which time scales we're looking at. In fact, I told you glaciers are responding, uh, responding slowly, but compared to ice sheets, they're responding really fast. Uh, so. Typically, when we try to, to simulate how glaciers evolve, um, we're looking at typically observations from what we call the, the satellite era. So from the 1980s and beyond, and typically this is what we uh, tune our models to and then, and then and we look if they work well, and then we, we use them to make projections. But if you would, you would be talking now not to a glacier, uh, someone working on glaciers, but someone working on ice sheets, then the ice sheet person will probably tell you, yeah, we're using paleo data. So they're probably going to be using uh, a lot of old moraine extents or other reconstructions of how the ice sheet looked in the past. And they'll, the first thing they'll try to do typically is to reproduce these past uh, observations. And in fact, the, the principle is the same. You use past observations, but the time scale is just very different. Then it's maybe over thousands of years. Well, glaciers respond slowly, slowly in the order of decades, but the order of decades is still fast compared to the millennia millennial time scales on which uh, the two big ice sheets uh, respond. So being such dynamic, um, I suppose, landscape features, the um, really kind of renders glaciers as a potential uh, or useful indicator as of climate change. We, we don't say that's like an accurate thing. Just, um, I think part of the reason that thought popped into my head was there's such a huge media discussion around glacial ice losses. We got, I think, COP26. Um, uh, I think the Glasgow, one of the universities in Glasgow, unfortunately, I can't remember which one, um, named a, a glacier uh, in Antarctica as, as Glasgow as a kind of symbol of hope that something will come out of the COP26. Um, do you think glaciers are a useful indicator of climate change in this case? So I think they're really symbols of climate change and because they're really showing if, if you have someone who doesn't believe in climate change and that things are changing, well, I think if you bring them to a glacier at one point and you show them pictures of how it looked before, it's, it's very uh, confronting. So I think they're, they're, a bit, they're a bit symbols of changing climatic conditions. They're some of the clearest indicators. I mean, people, if temperatures rise one or two degrees, will typically not immediately notice this, but a glacier that changes um, can be used as, well, to communicate science and, and to really also show, uh, to visualize changing climatic conditions. But they're also really used for scientific purposes. That's, I think, pretty interesting. There are some studies, and then, then it's on, on slightly longer time scales and typically for big glaciers. Uh, sometimes we also have something in between glaciers and ice sheets, which we refer to as ice caps. Ice caps cover the landscape, but they're not as big as the ice sheets. So typically in Iceland, now you have ice caps. Um, and in other Arctic regions. And for instance, there's also studies which use ice caps and we know how these ice caps behaved in the past. And then you can in fact change the situation around. So you're not gonna be putting some climate conditions and see how the glacier evolves. The question is how were the climate conditions in the past? We know how the glacier was. So you have different pieces of the puzzle. And so what you try to do in fact is you try to reproduce how you we know that the glacier or the ice cap was in the past and based on this you can say well this was only possible if temperatures were three degrees colder or if precipitation was so much higher so you can really use also glaciers and past glacier reconstructions so these so-called paleo reconstructions we can use these really also to say something about the climate of the past which is i think quite fascinating it's always a puzzle and you try to solve it and sometimes you don't know what 
the glacier evolution is, but you know what the temperature is, and then you, you solve it that way. But in other cases, you think you know at least how the glacier was in the past, but you wonder, well, how was the temperature? And so that's with these models, we're trying to, to glue that all together. Staying on the topic of your, of your uh, approach to research, um, and I suppose in the theme of uh, dynamic feedback loops affecting uh, of ice loss, uh, does this ice loss also affect uh, glaciological research as well then? If the, the thing that's been studied is disappearing dramatically, um, does that impact how you approach the work? Uh, does it perhaps matter less when things become more digital? Well, no, it, it, do, it does matter because um, as I explained to you, we need a lot of different types of observations for our work. And a lot of it is done with remote sensing, so which means from distance which is typically done with satellites, but also more and more by flying with drones over glaciers. But we also need to really go in the field uh, to, to measure things really in detail. And just from a practical point of view, some of these glaciers to which I used to go 10 years ago before starting my PhD, and if I go back to them now, we cannot take the same routes that we took to go up the glacier just because the glacier is less accessible and has retreated up. So from this perspective, just from a purely practical perspective, uh, it is sometimes challenging. Um, of course, we also know that in mountain regions, there's more risks. It's not only related to glaciers, but also the fact that there's a lot of, of permafrost, which means it's, it's like froze, frozen soils and rocks and others. And of course, if it warms, you get more rockfall. So just from a practical perspective, it plays a role. Um, and then it depends what you're, what you're um, willing to collect when you're on the glacier. Some people take these ice cores from glaciers, for instance, to say something about past climatic conditions. You can look at the air that is trapped within this ice and you can look at some isotopic relationships which are in there. Um, isotopic relationship, which means in fact is the types of ice which are in there. And these types of ice in fact uh, can tell you something about uh, the, the climate of the past in that uh, particular region. And so um, the reason why I'm explaining this so that people are going there to collecting ice, well, in some places this ice is super valuable because it gives you um, indications about past climatic conditions. But of course, once this ice is gone, you will not know what the climate of the past is there. And maybe there are an iconic example there is uh, on Kilimanjaro in Africa. And on Kilimanjaro in Africa, there's, there's still ice, but not a lot on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And we know if we go there now, we can still extract these cores, but it may be that in 20, 30 years, this ice is gone. And so this very valuable uh, indicator of past climatic conditions may also be, be gone. So, I mean, there's a lot of impacts of climate change on research, both the practical way of going there, but also what we want to collect can really be affected. So uh, with more warming, there's going to be a, a loss of these data archives um, and also accessing these data archives in the form of ice uh, also becomes more difficult, basically. Yes, yes. Uh, um, so staying on the theme of impacts, but perhaps stay, taking um, a step back a bit, um, is, could you tell us a bit more about uh, how glacial ice loss uh, might impact humans? Definitely. So glacier changes has effects on our, well, on, on many different scales. And by scales, I mean on, on, on also on spatial scales and depending on where you are. First of all, glaciers react everywhere in the world on raise, rising uh, temperatures, which are typically caused by people who don't particularly live, live close to the glaciers, just by uh, getting additional CO2 in, in the air, temperatures rise and temperatures rise and we see that glaciers are affected everywhere. But it's a bit also the same the other way around. Also when glaciers change, they can also have effects on people which live really far away. Um, I think maybe one of the, the important examples and I've already been mentioning this in the introduction is sea level rise. Um, these glaciers, these mountain glaciers, they don't contain that much ice you would think at first. Um, maybe to put that in perspective, the Antarctic ice sheet contains more than 50 meters of sea level rise. So if the whole Antarctic ice sheet would melt, sea levels would go up by 50 meters. That's globally. Um, if Greenland ice sheet would melt, sea levels would go up by seven meters, which is less, but still substantial. If all these 200,000 glaciers, what I'm mainly talking about today, if these 200,000 glaciers would melt, sea levels would go up by 30 to 40 centimeters. And at first you could be thinking of, okay, then maybe for sea level rise, we shouldn't care about uh, these glaciers compared to the ice sheets, but that's really not true because these glaciers, if you remember from what I said before, they really react uh, way faster. So in fact, we see that from the present day sea level rise, 
Uh, a lot of this, in fact, is caused by mountain glaciers. Um, kind of uh, as a rough, to put it in a, in, a, in a rough pictures, we have about three to four millimeters of sea level rise every year right now. And out of these three to four centimeters, uh, sorry, millimeters, three to four millimeters a year, luckily not centimeters, three to four millimeters a year. And out of these three to four millimeters, uh, we see that in fact, 25 to 30% of this, so around one millimeter is caused by these 200,000 glaciers. And there again, a sea level rise of 10 or 20 centimeters may not seem a lot to people, but that's already huge. It's huge for people who live uh, in coastal regions because there will be more erosions of the coastal regions, but there's also way bigger risk of having inundations. Um, at one point, if sea levels really go up a lot, uh, we'll have to, to build new defense mechanisms. Um, maybe a different perspective of looking at it is always, uh, when infrastructure is built to defend the coast, of course, it cannot be built to defend the, the biggest storms which will ever come. So for instance, infrastructure which now works for a storm which occurs and, and with, this, with, with, this, with, the, with the sea that goes inland, which, which can protect it against an event which occurs every thousand years. If, well, if your sea levels are 10 or 20 centimeters higher, this event will not occur every thousand years, but it may be occurring every century or even every, every decade, for instance. So there's so many examples, but one of them why glaciers matter, uh, at least on a, on a global scale, um, is really related uh, to sea level rise. Um, I don't know if I can continue to give other examples, because I think also locally there's some interesting ones, but maybe you, you, you want to add something there or ask some questions here. Yeah, sure, I think that's um, no, no, it's super interesting. I think just summarizing your point really um, is that perhaps the, the greater dynamism of mountain glaciers means there's a faster injection of that meltwater into the ocean, which um, introduces a lot of uncertainty for people looking into coastal protections. I think an example of that, I think from what you said about storms, for example, is uncertainty surrounding the um, cost and height of flood defences. Um, an extra few centimetres on top of a storm surge, which is already above um, an expected, um, uh, perhaps an expected uh, high wave, um, storm, like something that comes alongside a hurricane or something, um, it could be enough to overtop a, a barrier or something. So there's, yeah, there's a lot more um, uncertainty introduced, I think, by the rapid inclusion of uh, glacial meltwater. Um, yeah, I think my next question, to be fair, was to ask about the local impacts of glaciers yeah. as well. So rather than take up more time, I'll just let you uh, on to the next point you had in mind if that's okay yeah so yeah the, the local side and there again there's many sides of like as i've explained the glaciers are changing uh, so so they're going to be changing the landscape but uh, one of the things that glaciers are wonderful at doing is providing water to people living close to them or at least in the valleys downstream of glaciers and in some regions in the world they're extremely important when we're thinking of high mountain asia um, there's really a lot of people living in big basins like indus ganges brahmaputra where there's tens to hundreds of millions of people living. Um, and these people are very relying on water uh, from glaciers. And the way that this works a bit um, is before I was explaining how a glacier, a healthy one, so let's take a case without climate change, but a healthy one would always become a bit bigger during winter and would melt a bit during summer. But that's great because that's just when people need water most. It's typically during the hottest and driest periods of the year your glacier, which is in fact up there in the mountain, will be providing water to you. So that's really the time of the year when you need it most. So in fact, a glacier is a natural water resource waiting for you in the mountains and giving water. So what will happen if climatic conditions change? It's a bit twofold. At first, of course, there's even more water coming during summer. So typically in the coming decades, also people living um, in, in these plains in high mountain Asia where where there's all the water coming from the glaciers, at first they will have enough water because there's, these glaciers are melting too much because of climate change. And so they still be getting a lot of water during um, uh, summer when they need it most. However, on the longer term, once your glacier has disappeared, your natural water resource has gone up in the mountains. And if you don't have a natural water resource in the mountains, you're just not gonna be getting that water that you need from the glaciers. So people will, during the time of the year when they need it most in summer, uh, 
there will be less water coming uh, from these glaciers. And this depends a bit. So there's, there's going to be a peak in the water in summer, and then we're going to go to a level which is in fact lower uh, than, the, than your baseline. And this depends a bit on Earth where we are um, to, to, see, to see where we are in this, in this peak concept. So just to put it in perspective, in the European Alps, we think that we have reached the peak water now. So we're now expecting to, getting, to be getting less and less water during summer, um, which is problematic. But on the other hand, the glaciers in the European Alps are not the main water provisions. It's also the snow and there's others, so they play a role. But over the whole concept, they're, they're not as important, for instance, as in high mountains in Asia, where really are, people are really very depending on them. Uh, and there we see, for instance, that in high mountains in Asia, it seems that the, for now, the, the water levels that we're getting or that people are getting in summer are still rising. So there's still, there's a buffer now. Now we're in a situation which is okay. But that's, of course, only temporary. And at one point, we'll reach what we call the peak water. So the point where people will be getting most water during summer, and then we'll get a decline. And that this will be problematic, especially during the second part of the 21st century for people living uh, in high mountains in Asia. And yeah, it's because these, these regions are so heavily populated also that this water is really, really important. So if, if now you have a water quantity that you're getting during summer, but if in 50 years from now, you only get, be getting half, that's huge because you need that water for agriculture, for, well, for everything, for your household. And so this, this may cause severe problems. Um, yeah, so in addition to uh, perhaps increasing risk to coastal issues on a global level, a local scale is also a resource issue, really, um, which of course could have numerous knock-on uh, effects, um, which I think we're more political than glaciological, but um, you also mentioned uh, there would be a peak during the summer um, where there'd be a lot more water released. Um, could this also uh, relate to flood risk at all, do you think? Well, there's always this water coming uh, from the glaciers and this one is especially important. The, the moment during the year when they're the most important is towards the end of summer because first there's all the water also coming from snow the snow that always melts every year, but that comes and that melts every year. So these are places where there's no glaciers that will be formed. So the, the main peak that you get where there's really a lot of water coming, so now I'm speaking about peak throughout a year, is typically more, depending on the regions, but it's typically more towards the end of spring, early summer. And it's only during the second part of summer, typically that glaciers are really important in their water provision. And so there, the quantity of water that we'll be getting from the glaciers will be higher than the baseline, but not at the point of causing a floods or others. That's not really what we're expecting. It's, it's mostly the fact that it's already not that much water at these present day levels. And if even that level, which already is not so high or which is maybe now slightly higher because there's the melt, well, we're mainly afraid about the, the moment when this, these levels will be, will be dropping dramatically. Um, Sure. So I suppose that one of the key take home messages is even though I suppose, for example, over the Alps looks to be one of the more, more badly affected um, collections of glaciers, communities of glaciers, perhaps, um, the impact of its uh, lack of, of a, well, the impact of a reduced water resource um, is actually going to be bigger in like poorer nations. So there's an unequal distribution of the impacts of glacial loss, basically, from um, glacial melting. Correct, correct. So in fact, there was a very interesting study which, which appeared one years ago by colleagues. It was led by colleagues from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and what they showed, they're really referring to these glaciers as water towers, and what they made is a water tower index. So they're gonna, they said for every mountain region in the world where there's glaciers, they said, how important are they? as water towers. And what they did, in fact, is they, sh they showed, in fact, that it depends on two different things. It depends really not, it depends on uh, how much water they're providing. So the, these, these water towers, so how much water they're able to provide, but it also really depends uh, on the people who live there. So then it's to really look at how the impacts are, you need to look at the whole socioeconomic structure um, of, of the, um, of the system. So in fact, there's a kind of, there's a supply index, there's how much supply, and then there's also the demand. There's, it's a bit like an economic market, but there's a supply and there's the demand. Uh, and of course, in places where the supply is at risk, 
and where the demand is very high, well, there it's clear, of course, uh, that uh, the glaciers are very important as water towers, so they, they would score high on a water tower index. And this means really that, well, these regions will be really strongly affected. Let's take another case. If you go somewhere in the high Arctic, there may also be big changes in the water provisions, but if there's not that many people living there, the impact will be will be more limited. So it's, I think that's quite fascinating about this research. It's a bit putting everything together. It's not only the purely un understanding and modeling how the, the, the system Earth will change, but it's also, of course, taking into account uh, yeah, how societies will evolve and uh, how econ what the economic reality is there and for what water is needed, but also taking into account political tension and, and all of these aspects. Um, so, but I would say, yes, uh, high mountain Asia and the Andes, I didn't mention the Andes, but also the Andes in Southern America are definitely two regions where glacier loss will have a big impact, uh, at least from a water supply perspective for people. Sure. Um... Thanks uh, for the answer. Um, I just want to perhaps move away from the impacts of glacier loss on humans and think about it more from a um, from, from the perspective of perhaps so that's a bit more geophysical. So would the loss of mountain glaciers also feedback into climate change perhaps, or perhaps impact geomorphological development? I mean, they have um, through car valleys over centuries, thousands of years, um, where the loss of these glaciers have affects um, these earth systems. Yes, so so glacier changes you can really see them very clearly in landscapes, and not only for big ice sheets, but also glaciers. Typically, when they advance and when they reach a maximum, they form a so-called moraine, which is like like this kind of a bulldozer, which is advancing, taking all the material and depositing it at a, at a given uh, place. So of course, there's these moraines in the landscape, which which reflect, so that's a direct influence on the landscape. There's, there's these moraines. Uh, there's also the way um, that material is eroded under glaciers, which typically, of course, when we're looking at the way that this will be changing the landscape, that's on longer time scales. But when we're thinking about the sediment input, which comes into rivers and which then has a lot of effects also for people downstream or for hydropower companies well of course these will all change under uh if if glaciers change so also from a, a geophysical perspective yes they're, they're they're forming the landscape and they will have also impacts uh yeah more directly also maybe a bit at the interface between this and hydrology is also glacier lakes we know that a lot of glaciers um by advancing and by by, by the way that the ice moves in fact, that they have over deepenings in the bedrock, which means that uh, over deepening is really kind of a depression in, in the, the bedrock, so in the, the rocks which are underneath the glacier. And of course, if you're a glacier retreat, you can get huge lakes, so these so-called pro-glacial lakes, so the glacier lakes which are in front uh, of glaciers. Um, there's also other lakes which are potentially dangerous, and these are um, there's some superglacial lakes, but especially also ice dammed lakes. So, which quite often form in between a glacier and, and, and the surrounding mountains. And of course, if your glacier retreats, you can also get more of these uh, sudden events in which a lot of um, water is released. Uh, these are so-called gloves. So these are glacier, glacial lakes outburst floods. Um, and there's, there's also some research being done whether uh, these would also be increasing under changing climatic conditions or not. I guess that's another risk then is potentially um... Uh, low frequency, high impact uh, flood events on these um, otherwise damned beaches. Um, yeah, so just I think to final uh, few minutes, let's sort of focus kind of on the future a bit more. Um, and one is, well, I suppose, the key question is like, what will, does the future of uh, glaciers look like? Um, are we are we going towards a, a glacier or an ice free world, as people like to put it? Well, it will really depend on how the climate will evolve. And so it's really going to be depending on the actions that, that we as a society are, will be taking uh, today. It's clear that under a, a bad case or bad a case with a lot of warming, which used to be referred to sometimes before as business as usual. Nowadays, it's recommended to not refer to this as business as usual anymore, because luckily, we think that we're not going to be ending up in that very high case. But if we would keep the emissions levels at the extremely high level and then we get warming 
which can globally be globally be in the order of three, four, five degrees by the end of the century. By the way, you should always keep in mind all these numbers about warming, plus one, plus two, plus three, that's always on a global average. And mountain regions and polar regions tend to tend more than the, than the average. So typically that means that even stronger warming for mountain regions and for glaciers. Well, if we would end up in such a case, then of course there will be almost no ice left uh, in the coming centuries. Um, I think there's, there's, uh, there's hopeful signs. There, there's good signs that we're not gonna be heading in that direction. So I think um, normally going towards the ice free world, I don't think so. But of course the, we see that um, if you want to limit the, the, the warming levels to plus 1.5 or plus 2 degrees uh, on average, uh, we need to make uh, a lot of investments. And there's a lot which needs to happen today. And it's clear, and I think it's been clear also for everything we've been seeing in the news, that uh, unfortunately, also from what came out of, of Glasgow, there's some things were reached. But there's always the question about how fast are we, how fast are, are we uh, getting there? And it's, I think, for glaciers, at least every year or every decade plays even a big role of further warming so uh, likely not in an ice-free world but the question whether we'll be having 30 40 50 60 or 70 percent of the ice mass left so that's that not for the european alps but, but globally well this will really be determined by uh by the policy actions taken taken now and sean from what you said earlier um it sounds like i think you mentioned the uh, glacial ice loss uh is potentially accelerating as well. So really, this this time limit of making decisions um, on climate change uh, is is critical for um, mountain glaciers, especially, um, which I suppose increases the vulnerability of those people you mentioned before who are um, most affected by it. Um, I, I suppose let's come to my final uh, question, um, and it's uh, what was the key take away message from the audience. I guess as you start approaching, uh, talking about uh, decision making around COP26 um, and the potential impacts from policy decision makers, perhaps it's a key point to conclude a webinar with your uh, thought. Yes, one of the, 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 the takeaway points, I think, um, is that glaciers, and I, of course, I'm very uh, narrow minded and I really like glaciers. So I've been talking a lot about glaciers, but uh, I think a lot of the things that I've been telling today about glaciers also apply to other systems. If you would talk to someone who's working on oceans or someone who's specifically looking at uh, the atmosphere and the levels of warming, looking at, uh, at forests, I think uh, there, there will be a lot of, of different examples. Uh, so what, what I've been talking about today was very much focused on glaciers, of course, but I think for glaciers, um, yeah, just the fact that they respond slowly and it's always a question, what is slow? They're fast compared to big ice sheets, but respond slowly. And so that today's action will have a, a big effect on their, on their future evolution. Um, and it mean, I think the impacts, I, I just highlighted a few, but just to give you an idea, there's many more impacts even of changing glaciers. So there's this, there's the, the sea level rise, there's the water uh, provision, but they're also really important. I mean, if they cause natural hazards, um, then this, this can have huge effects. Um, glaciers are also, also have a quite important touristic value in the European Alps, but also in other regions uh, where a lot of people depend also on, on glaciers being there. Um, they're important also from a water perspective. For instance, there's countries like Switzerland, which generates a lot of their electricity with hydropower. And this hydropower is also in part related to how much water comes from glaciers. So if your glaciers change, this may affect how much electricity you can produce through hydropower. So, there's just really, really plenty of effects. And what we try to do is really make the best simulations that we can. So we try to make some good predictions. And I find that really fascinating because it's what I really try to explain system earth, everything is connected. So all of these concepts that I've explained with changing temperatures and how your glaciers change. It's not that A happens and this has an effect on B. In system earth, typically A happens, this has an effect on B, which affects C, but C also had an effect on A, which affects D. And of course we, we can think about this, but our human mind at one point cannot make all these connections. And so maybe to, to, to visualize this to people, uh, to explain to what they do when I tell them I do thousands of lines of codes where I'm, I'm sitting behind my PC and pressing on all buttons. Well, these lines of code, they try to connect all these systems in the, that, that determine how a glacier evolves. Uh, and it's, it's something fascinating to do. 
on the one hand, it's it's sometimes frustrating and it's it's sad to see how glaciers evolve. But I mean, the, the, the work in itself, I think, is really interesting. And I think or I hope that we're able to make better and better projections for uh, how glaciers evolve in the future. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to the audience Q&A. Um, I've had a few sent in Perfect. to me. Um, I just want to say, if you're watching right now, you can um, enter a question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Just type it in there and then uh, we can answer it. Um, okay. Yes, sure. So I've got um, a few questions sent in already. Um, and one is um, talking about artificial glaciers. Uh, it's like, do you think glaciers should be uh, preserved like they do for example skiing etc um, or is it like a waste of resources it's a very good question and it's one that isn't easy to answer um, we know that we can on a very small scale at least we could protect glaciers and there's different ways of doing this but the most classic way of doing this is putting something very white on top of the glacier so typically a white blanket and if your surface is white of course more of the incoming solar energy will be reflected so you get less loss so in say it sounds like an amazing idea why not cover all glaciers well it's totally not feasible because it's it's extremely expensive uh, to do so it's very um, labor intensive to do so and you can also only cover very small parts of glaciers uh, with this in the end um, so it's very expensive it's also probably not that good for the environment because it's typically done with plastics and others which then also break off and there's also these microplastics which are everywhere in the environment so from that perspective but nevertheless in some cases uh, people um, think it is worth to do so and it, it works I mean there, there's some skiing areas where so that people could ski longer during years typically when you ski in european alps most of the time you will not be skiing on a glacier but sometimes in a skiing area you could also be skiing on a glacier well if you have a bigger glacier you can have people also uh skiing for longer during the season so there's at small scales um there's people putting blankets on glaciers another example is a glacier in switzerland which is one of the most visited glaciers it's very well accessible and they have also an ice cave where you can really go in the glacier on the side and there they also put blankets uh, to, to really protect the glacier. So it works well, but I think it's totally unfeasible at the large scale. Also, no, not only practically, but also economically, it's, it's, it, it would cost really, really a lot. And so the only way to save glaciers in the end is try to get the temperature at a given level. And there are some crazy ideas about also uh, putting a lot of snow on, on glaciers, on this multi-edge glacier, which I explained before. Um, but we have been doing some 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 studies on this also really to see whether it would really be feasible and it seems to be very very hard to do and it would cost not in the order of millions but really hundreds of millions of euros to maybe have a glacier which instead of retreating three kilometers over a given time span would only retreat one or two so it's not the way to go but it's it, it is of course something um well not the way to go that's my opinion but it's uh I think there's really some challenges linked to that and on the on the bigger in the bigger frame the, the only way to do so is to limit levels of warming uh, and that's the best way to save glaciers uh, so perhaps useful for uh, a local short-term business solution but not really the answer to um, <laughs> vanishing resources um, okay so another question uh, touches more on your outreach at work um, and it's uh, as someone who engages the public on science, how do you handle communicating on such heated issues uh, like ice melt and climate change? Was that a pun? Maybe. It is. It is a pun. It is definitely a heated issue. Um, typically, what I what I try to do when talking about this, when going in schools, of course, is um, I, I try to get people excited for the topic. It's of course different if you talk to school kids, uh, to adults who are already maybe sometimes skeptical from before the conversation starts. But I try to get them excited to show really the also the cool side, also upon to the of being a glaciologist and uh, and and going on the field and flying with a helicopter to a remote place where we're, where we'll be drilling. So to to get them excited and then really to show them, I think one of the easy things for me to communicate about glaciers, for instance, what I have to do compared to uh, oceanographer who's talking about changing oceans or someone talking about an, an, another aspect of system earth is that they're so extremely visual so there's so many of these images where you see the glacier in 1850 which was huge covering a whole valley and you see the the, the, 
or even with time frames, you see it in between, you really see how these glaciers have massively uh, changed. So that is something that I typically try to do. And then what I always try to do is really let the science talk for, for it. Like I'm not the one advocating exactly what needs to happen. And I'm not saying that we should stop uh, warming uh, and you need to, to, to do all of these things. Um, what I'm trying to do is really let the science talk and say, well, if uh, levels of warming will be very high, well, this will happen with glaciers. If we were able to, to limit the levels, well, this will happen with glaciers. So I, let to, I try to let the science speak and a bit almost to put it in a blunt way, because of course it's not always that black and white, but I almost try to be really the, the nerdy scientist who does the numbers and then gives it to someone else uh, and that person then then can make decisions, the policymaker or others. So that's that's a bit the approach that I try to take. Really apply maths and physics through these models on system Earth, on glaciers, and try to make as good predictions as possible. Yeah, sure. So um, when it comes to communication in the public, um, obviously keeping it simple, but um, also try and, I guess, let the public come to their own conclusion from the science as, as you had, really. Yes, I yeah. think as scientists, that's the best we can do. Of course, at one point, there's a question, should we as scientists really be engaged and also be the one saying that we need to do this or not? And I think there's, there's different opinions and I think there's pros and cons to being more reserved and giving numbers or to also really trying to say, well, we need to act upon this. Um, but yeah, let, let the science speak for it. It's always, it's always very strong, of course, if, if you can just make projections and then just just show what, what will happen uh yeah with, with glaciers under changing climatic conditions um i think it's time for a couple more questions uh and another one Perfect. is um is there potential to make gains in uh, glacial in glaciers so I, I guess what they mean is um i guess we've talked a lot about glacial loss and vanishing in the warming climate is a, a, a possibility of it um, going back? <laughs> so, so the question is whether it's a possibility of, of glaciers growing back or two? The question is, um, is it possible that um, there might be glacial gains? And I'm assuming they mean um, uh, potential for glaciers growing back, yes. So, uh, glaciers uh, can typically grow back. I mean, if you put in colder climatic conditions again, in the unlikely case that we're able to limit the levels of warming at one level and then put them back down again or that they evolve to that way down glaciers will eventually with some delayed response but will eventually start growing again uh, so for most glaciers this works uh, for ice sheets it's a bit more complicated because ice sheets are so big so that this, this ice sheet in Greenland and the one in Antarctica they're so big that sometimes you have two three thousand meters of ice and of course if you melt all that ice away and you would then put the same colder conditions back it may not be regrowing to the same state and that is simply just because you're 2000 meters lower because you've lost this so then not then it's not the climate signal but it's just the fact that you're lower and of course the lower you are in the atmosphere the warmer it is and then sometimes this is the so-called or one of these so-called points of no return where for instance but it doesn't really apply to to glaciers it's more for ice sheets because glaciers are way thinner but some ice sheets may really be at a point where at one point they start losing and losing mass. And then even if you would put the conditions which are now here to, to get the glacier at this level, uh, sorry, the ice sheet, it will not be able to, to regrow anymore. But in say glaciers, if you wait long enough, so it's still the order of decades to centuries because they respond slowly, but eventually a glacier which is retreating now, if you put in some colder climatic conditions, it will eventually then re-advance. Yes. Uh, so if we, Get into a negative emission scenarios uh, soon glaciers should be bouncing back in the next century hopefully is is what is, is what we might expect well it depends on on which on which levels uh, we'll get a stabilization of temperature but let's take the best case where we can get this around plus 1.5 degree compared to pre-industrial levels well then we'll be we'll be getting glaciers which are approximately today's size or even smaller still than today because they're still res they're still responding and um, we're now about plus one, plus 1.1 degrees compared to pre-industrial temperatures. So even in the best case, where we would end up at plus 1.5 degrees, glaciers will be smaller than they are today. Uh, and just uh, one final question. Um, uh, you mentioned point of no returns. 
do do they exist for these features then or, or are they useful um a useful communication tool i guess to describe these dynamics as having points of no return well they, they we think that they do exist of course it's always difficult because this, these are things that we model we simulate and we try to put all these these elements uh, um, together i mean i'm not an expert in, in working on these so-called tipping points and points of no returns for ice sheets so i wouldn't uh, venture too far in that direction to answer that question but there's strong there's strong evidence at least from a modeling perspective that indeed the ice sheets may at some point uh, due to dynamics, this is one concept that I explained before about the fact that temperatures are lower at high elevation, that if you lose your mass, it doesn't come back. But there's, for instance, for the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, we know that uh, a lot of, of these glaciers which are in contact with the oceans, they're on retrograde uh, slopes for the bedrock. And due to this, without going into details, this is just very unfortunate and means that sometimes just by losing a bit of mass at the front of the Antarctic ice sheet, you could get huge retreats which could then have an effect on the inland ice. So I think there is definitely some some of these points of, of no return do exist. And of course, this is something we're learning more and more about by making simulations uh, and, and making better projections. And it, it is, there, there are things that we need to take into account also and try to understand. Great, thank you. Um, so we're just about out of time. So I'm going to uh, conclude the webinar. I'd like to say thank you, uh, Harry, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, everyone who has uh, enjoyed. And yes, have a, a good day. Goodbye for now. Bye bye.